Hello and welcome to this webinar on remote teaching. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Steve Adcock. I'm Deputy Director of Academies here at United Learning. Um, we're a group of state and independent schools covering most corners of the country, as you can see on the map there. I'm joined today by two of our central subject advisors, Catherine Barker for music and Mariu Huriaga for languages, as well as Adam Scourfield from Goresbrook School in Dagenham and Laura Richardson from Glenmore and Winston Academies in Bournemouth. We're going to take the chance today to share what we've learned about effective online teaching. We've chosen languages and music as we believe these subjects present particular challenges for the remote teacher. So we hope that by exploring these two subjects we'll find solutions to remote teaching that can help teachers of all subjects. Please feel free to use the chat function um, throughout the session today and we'll do our best to cover these questions at the end. Next slide please. So a useful starting point here is this paper published by the EEF and pretty much the opening line of this paper uh, is that teaching quality is more important than how lessons are delivered, which reminds us that remote teaching is still teaching. So let's not give up on everything we've learned about what works in the classroom. Technology here should be our servant uh, and not our master. So just as in the classroom, and in fact, even more so, it's vital that each lesson has a clear and specific purpose, building students' understanding over time. In simple terms, what do we want students to be able to do at the end of the lesson that they can't do at the beginning? So the usual rules of teaching still apply. Clear explanation in small steps with modelling and checking for understanding, gradually building students' independence. Next slide, please. So through our online teaching, we've tried to retain the best features of school life, maintaining the lesson structures we use in school and teachers bringing the same warmth and reassurance to their online teaching as their face to face lessons. We think that lesson structures should support the subject and not the other way around. So it's important that a music lesson should look and feel and sound like a music lesson. Above all, we think it's vital to plan the lesson from the pupil's perspective with crystal clear instructions for what to do and how to do it. Now we'll see these principles being put to work in music and languages, starting with music. Over to you, Catherine. Thank you, Sleeve. Next, next slide, thank you. And next slide, please. So teachers in United Learning working alongside me in central office develop numerous resources for remote teaching during lockdown and we're continuing to develop these lesson materials. Our ambition was to keep these lessons as similar as we could to a typical music lesson. We know that musical knowledge emerges from immersion in music and we need to keep the lesson intrinsically musical. This is potentially tricky in an online or remote scenario. We can't ever fully replace the classroom teacher or the classroom environment with its specific resources and space, but it is possible with careful thought. And the Oak National Music Lessons do a great job of this. And I know it was a priority for that team who worked on this during the summer. As with other subjects, a consistent structure was important for our lessons. It gives students a familiar roadmap for that lesson. We also decided to front load lesson content, partly so that students could make connections to the content during the lesson and also because it mitigates any sort of drop off during the lesson. If they tune out for any reason, students have still heard the headlines. There is so much brilliant digital content out there and we wanted to make use of this. So, for example, BBC 10 pieces, material from Inspireworks and other arts organisations. These resources give authenticity and they often include really excellent modelling. It's also possible that when working online, other opportunities open up that might not be possible in the classroom. Uh, for example, students can have access to tools on their devices for recording, which just wouldn't be possible in some music classrooms. And our lessons were developed within Microsoft PowerPoint, but Forms also works really well, where embedding any sort of media like video or audio is pretty painless, alongside building in assessment, which can self mark, which is always a great time saver. So let's look at how all of this comes together in two specific lesson examples. Next slide, please. Our first example is a lesson teaching offbeats and accents as part of a scheme that's designed to secure and embed knowledge of rhythm and pulse. It's suitable for Key Stage 3, definitely builds on work done in Key Stage 2. And we made use of the fantastic resources from the London Philharmonic Orchestra with materials developed by the brilliant Re Rachel Leach. Many thanks to Rachel for allowing us to refer to this in the webinar. The lesson has been used for asynchronous delivery, i.e. it's pre-recorded, but could also be used as a synchronous live lesson. But no matter what the delivery method, 
active participation is throughout, and that's most through some form of music making. Next slide, please. We chose to start off all our lessons with a very short review, and you can see this here through the brief memory platform. It includes a pause point with those on screen solutions. Now, it may not feel like the most musical way to start a lesson, but music only features once a week in the timetable. So, this is a way to support continuous review over time. We need to be mindful it needs to be short so that we can crack on with the music making. But also in a live lesson, these starting points give time to do the register, make sure everyone's logged in and, and ready to start. Next slide, please. So keeping this lesson just like a normal music lesson, we would do some kind of practical starter so that we can gauge with music as soon as possible. I'm now going to play you a short example of it now. Hopefully this will work with the audio and feel free to join in. Next slide, please. Let's start by speaking this through together. We're going to count continually in quavers, and there are eight quavers in each bar, and keep the pulse going. When we see a larger number, we will say that number louder and with more emphasis. OK, are you ready? Off we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight. Well done. Very good. One more time. One, two, off we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 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 Very, very good. Now let's clap that. Give your hands a quick rub. Very nice. Here we go. No counting now. The counting goes in your head. Are you ready? Off we go. to do okay so did you notice there's lots of um, positive tone lots of praise clear counting that gives the pulse are you ready off we go this is all stuff that we'd be seeing in a typical classroom and it's even more important in this remote teaching scenario next slide please so now you can see the example of front loading we present the main idea for the lesson near the start and keep this simple and concise Exact definitions provided alongside another opportunity to make links to the practical do now. Next slide, please. This continues where the stimulus for the lesson, which is Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, is introduced. Again, it's to the point and there's audio included. Listening works really well in a remote lesson and there's scope to build on this in future lessons. Next slide, please. And from here, we're in a typical practical music lesson, developing the knowledge of offbeat through playing the piece itself. The music is broken down section by section, leading towards a full performance playthrough. In this instance, the activity is body percussion. This is great. It's universally accessible and not really reliant on any specific instrumental resources. Next slide, please. To end the lesson, there is an opportunity to be more flexible with outcomes. And this is where an online lesson might differ from one in a subject specific classroom. Essentially, you need to use the resources the students have to hand. So in fact, many of our schools actually survey their students to find out what they had at home. They could take it into account with their planning. Now here the options are presented to open, you know, for the open task, either continue with body percussion, move on singing, use an instrument, again, linking to that great external resource from the LPO. And the lesson always ends with a summary and this signposts posts any other additional tasks, for example, a quiz. I'll now hand over to Adam, who's going to take you through a similar lesson for Key Stage 4. Adam, over to you. Thanks, Catherine. I'm going to give you a specific example that we've used at Boresbrook with regards to Key Stage 4 music. The principles are exactly the same. We should be trying to interleave content from previous lessons, from previous moments where we didn't have this remote teaching. Uh, situation and we should be trying to make those lessons as similar as possible to what the students would experience when they're in a standard classroom environment. Um, the lessons have to remain challenging, they have to be ambitious because the expectations haven't changed. The students are going to have to still do the course, they're going to have to still complete the exam and therefore we have to keep the academic rigour as high as possible. And just like Steve and Catherine have exemplified before, 
The use of technology is only there to enhance the delivery. It's there for modelling, it's there for exemplification, but it's not necessarily there for the students to have to complete work on. Because as we know, and Dagenham is no different, we often serve students who are in a situation where they don't have access to particular resources. And we really must keep that at the forefront of our minds when we're producing this lesson content. Next slide, please. So just like Catherine exemplified, we always start the lessons with some sort of memory platform a do now to recap prior learning. This is exceptionally important when it comes to key stage four because they're going to have to have that core knowledge embedded deep in their long term memory in order to be able to play and to be able to recall information um, with skill. Uh, after the do now, after this memory platform bit, we then have our explanation. And this is where we use audio visual examples, just like we would do in the classroom, apart from this time it's embedded in the presentation or in the forms if you're doing it in that sort of format. We try and chunk these things up into different sections, into short spaces where there's pause points in between. Because not only does that help the cognitive load on the learner, but it also ensures that we're keeping the concentration of those young people, especially when they have all these numerous distractions when they're at home. Next slide, please. We then come on to the modelling aspect. Now, as you can see from the slide, uh, the slide on the left hand side has the African rhythms that we were discussing uh, in previous lessons, uh, we're trying to show how polyrhythms interconnect with each other and how cross rhythms move across. Now, I've used a program called Loom, which uh, works in exactly the same way as a lot of screen recording programs. The students are able to see me uh, in the corner physically modeling what these rhythms should sound like, as well as having an exemplification of it on screen. And then we would encourage them to be playing this back on anything that they happen to have at their disposal, pots, pans or musical instruments or even just clapping or drumming a table, for example. We then use digital audio workstations to try and give a realistic interpretation of what those instruments might sound like. This is GarageBand, but you can use a, a plethora of online digital audio workstations in order to exemplify it. And again, like Steve and Catherine have said before, we're not expecting students to have access to these digital audio workstations all the time, but we can use them as a way of exemplifying best practice, of exemplifying the best version of that particular model. Next slide, please. We then try to always include a composition task where they can the, the students are not only playing, but they're able to synthesize their playing with their sort of contextual knowledge and the theoretical knowledge and try and build a piece themselves. So this is just an example of one that we've done with Key Stage 4 in the context of African rhythms, where they have to use the rhythms that they've learned previously and played in the earlier part of the lesson and then start to build their own rhythms. Now, it's really important when we're doing this that they are able to build them but then also we want them to record them so that we can assess their playing and assess their understanding of how these rhythms fit together. And that's when we try and use all the platforms that we have available. Next slide, please. So our students, hopefully, or the majority of our students all have access to mobile phones um, and or a device like that, which which means that they can record things very easily. Now at Gorsbrook and throughout United Learning, we use Microsoft Teams in order to get students to hand in practical work. And that's really useful because it, we can see straight away who's handed it in. We can mark it, we can feedback and we can give it back to them in real time. Or if it's a pre-recorded lesson, then obviously we can just check it after the deadline is finished. Again, mark it and feedback. We also use Microsoft Forms to be able to track their answers alongside specific sections of the lesson. Again, if you're doing a live lesson, you can do this in real time. And if it's a pre-recorded lesson, then you can just check the answers after the lesson's finished. But either way, this can still be accessed from a mobile phone or another device such as that. And that is how we piece together the key stage for offer uh, at Gorsbrook. We like to keep it as musical as possible and we like to embed all the knowledge that we've learned previously in order to create a really musical experience. I'm going to hand back to Steve. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Adam and Catherine. It's really striking to see how you've maintained and even enhanced the unique spirit of your subject through the online curriculum. I just want to take the chance to highlight as well um, how we've seen in music there, they've maintained the ambition of their curriculum. And I think going back to our curriculum in trying to retain that ambition is really critical to successful online teaching. And similarly, retaining the, the, the basic shape of classroom teaching. So whatever structure or format a school would typically use for its classroom teaching will tend to work well for online teaching too. Going back to that key point from the EEF that good teaching remains good teaching no matter what the, the delivery model. We're now going to take a look at languages, so over to you, Mariu. Thanks, Steve. So for the uh, Modern Foreign Languages case study, we've decided to focus mostly on asynchronous or pre-recorded lessons because we think they really exemplify very, very well where we think that classroom teaching is exactly the same as a remote teaching, whether it might be live teaching or pre-recorded, and where it, there are differences that we need to take into account when planning and delivering. So these lessons, like the music ones that, that Catherine was mentioning before, have all been uh, recorded using PowerPoint and a voiceover, but, but other platforms can be used. And they sit in our uh, sequence of curriculum, in a sequence of learning, but they can also be used in isolation if you want them for uh, revision purposes or homework or for catch up. And the content, once they have been um, designed, can be used as they were designed for uh, independent access by the pupils remotely as pre-recorded or asynchronous lessons, but they can also be used in live teaching or indeed in the classroom. Uh, next slide, please. So for us, the most important thing was to make sure that these lessons, these pre-recorded lessons, felt and look like modern languages lessons. So we've gone for familiar activities, like the one you've got in front of you. This pyramid translation is something that uh, is very much in use in our classrooms. Um, so we've gone for clarity and simplicity. We haven't uh, tried to include loads of different activities in these lessons, but we've stuck to uh, a number of known and trusted lessons both by teachers and pupils. Where we think this is quite different from classroom teaching is in the fact that the slides need to be self-sufficient because you will not be there in the classroom to clarify any, any confusion about the, 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 um, the task. So the instructions need to be very clear. Any answers, any resources that are required to complete the task need to be provided with the slides. And of course, you're not there physically to encourage pupils to complete the activities. So a lot of encouragement needs to be provided as you go along as well. Next slide, please. And we think that perhaps this is the biggest difference between classroom teaching and remote teaching. If you're doing live teaching from home, um, there are certain things you can do to check that pupils are on task um, and certain ways in which you can encourage them, but it's limited compared with the classroom environment. And if you're using these pre-recorded or asynchronous lessons, then definitely you cannot check uh, that your students are not getting distracted. So for us, it was very important to maximize the buy-in from pupils. And to do this, we use different strategies a bit like Steve was saying at the beginning we try to plan these lessons always from the pupils perspective so we took into consideration how long it would take them to complete it what resources they would need where they would find it difficult we always gave them a context of where this lesson sits within their particular learning process and and provide them a sum with a summary at the end that would put things again in context but also um praise them and, and tell them what uh, what they could achieve or they have achieved because they've completed all the activities. And we've been sharing the rationale behind all of the tasks that we've asked them to complete. For example, whenever we've expected pupils to write sentences in full, which we know from classroom practice that is not something they enjoy doing, most of them, we've always explained to them why in this particular moment it was important for the learning that they did so. Um, or when we've asked them to use a different color pen to highlight the, their um, corrections, we've also explained this will help you to identify which areas you, you still need to work on. And when it's not necessary for them to write in full, we've always specifically said this time you can just write T or F or true or false, 
or just A, B, A, A1, or just, just do the, your matching exercises. And in our pre-recorded lessons, like you heard from Catherine's and like you would be doing in your classroom, there is a lot of praise and encouragement. And we often say things like this exercise is out of seven. If you've managed five or six, you've done really well. And we acknowledge where things are difficult as well. Next slide, please. Um, our analysis and research also tells us that a lot of students that begin their synchronous lessons might not be finishing them. So it was also very important for, for us to make sure that we include the appropriate range and the right level of challenge that we want our pupils to access right from the beginning of the lesson. So we had to think a little bit differently here and um, we used diff different strategies to ensure that this was the case. For example, like you've got in front of you, this sentence builder. We've used sentence builders from year seven onwards to, uh, but then exploiting the language in incremental steps. Taking this example that you can see, um, perhaps the first, the easiest exercise could be that the teacher reads aloud one of the boxes and the pupil simply needs to note down or say aloud the coordinates, because you can see we put the coordinates here. The next incremental step could be that the teacher reads a whole longer sentence using one item for each color row, but one of the words is missing and the pupil needs to listen intently to work out which word has been missed. And then, of course, you can build that up and then perhaps ask them to translate from the English that you're reading aloud using the sentence builder to provide the French or indeed to use the sentence builder to write their own sentences. Next slide, please. This is an example of a sentence builder from year seven. And as you can see, we always give pupils the answers after we've asked them to complete the task. Next slide. Another strategy we have used to make sure that the right level of challenge and the range of language that we want all our pupils exposed to is that from the beginning of the lesson is the use of parallel translations like the one you've got in front of you. Next slide. And perhaps one of the biggest, if not the biggest challenge for MFL uh, remote teaching is speaking. Um, we have taken a very um, realistic approach here and we have um, accepted that certain things like spontaneous speaking um, is not possible to, to, to teach remotely. Um, if you're doing live teaching, there are certain things you can do, but you're quite limited with the teacher and one pupil response. You cannot do the kind of pair activities or activities, speaking activities in threes that we often do in the classroom. And of course, if you're using a pre-recorded or a synchronous lesson, that is just not going to be possible. So what we've done in our recorded lessons is to concentrate on the skills that can be uh, modeled and practiced remotely. For example, photo card preparation, descriptions, um, role plays, and we have made a point of focusing on pronunciation in all of our lessons. And all of them, KISTA 3 and KISTA 4, would include moments where the pupils are expected to do some loud repetitions to keep practicing the language because they will not be having the interaction with other students and with the teacher that they would, in the, would have in the classroom. Next slide, please. And this uh, and we've also provided um, our students with some specific speaking lessons. Uh, we've done pho phonics lessons for year seven and eight Spanish and French, like the example you've got in front of you, how to describe a photo. And also for year sevens, which might not have done this before, we've given them tips on how to prepare and sort of not memorize, but sort of retain the information for an oral presentation. And this takes me to the next, the last point I want to make. Next slide, please which is another big challenge for remote teaching for MFL, which is how to make sure there is independent work happening in these pre-recorded lessons. So as with speaking, we have some, if you like, independent work lessons, like we've got some for extended writing or how to tackle a difficult translation, but it was important for us that we provided our students with opportunities for independent work in every lesson, and that independent work was not limited to extended writing. So to do this, we had to be very careful on the, um, um, not so much on the task, but on how to go about the answering, the giving them the answer. So we had to do a lot of step-by-step -step support for their own self-checking. Um, the example you've got in front of you is a listening, because we think reading and listening also need to be included in these independent work tasks. Um, and instead of just giving the students the answers, A, D, E, the teacher here would pick up from the transcript the key language, the distractors, 
anything that would give them the answer, but also things that they can employ in future listening exercises. And if the task is a writing task, because obviously you as a teacher, you might be very limited as to how much of those writings you can read and, and provide individual feedback on. It's important that the teacher does a little bit of predicting. So from your experience, thinking of the common misunderstandings, the usual mistakes that pupils make and sort of go over those in your step by step guided um, marking afterwards. And now I'm just going to pass on to Laura, who's going to walk you through a typical <coughs> stage four lesson. OK, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to talk about a typical lesson I planned for Key Stage 4 for remote learning. Um, I'll talk about where the lesson planning differs to being in a classroom or live on Teams, but hopefully doesn't compromise on challenge and um, the engagement and progress of students. So this example um, was about ideal holidays, a lesson which comes at the end of the topic of holidays and is designed specifically to help students access higher grades in writing. As with all lessons, you can see on the screen now, um, we start by recapping prior knowledge with a quiz on Microsoft Forms. On completion, the quiz provides students with a mark and information on the questions they got wrong. You can add a note um, about why they might have got a question wrong, which you can see on the screen there. And then this can help students understand and it can inform my future teaching when I look at which ones they got wrong. This is no different to a low stakes quiz, a starter mat, um, something you'd use in class, except for that it's done electronically. And if anything, I think this increases motivation and engagement as you've got that personalised response for each student. We would do exactly the same in live lessons and um, it was a great way of getting them settled and welcomed at the beginning of the lesson, getting started with something straight away. Next slide, please. The next stage um, is input of new content. And for this particular lesson, I've prepared seven sentences in the conditional tense about things they might like to do on an ideal holiday. As with a classroom or live lessons on Teams, um, I control the input of language so as to avoid mistakes. I use icons to help students make visual connections um, and I go over the pronunciation. The main difference at this point is that I can't check this pronunciation, so I rely on students repeating it to themselves and I encourage them to do this as many times as they need and rewinding the video, repeating the process. I will also flood this language for the remainder of the lesson, giving them as much chance as possible to hear the same pronunciation. During live lessons, I would be able to check the pronunciation by asking students individually um, to unmute and repeat, um, which was an excellent way to overcome this barrier. Um, I know I had talked a bit about languages um, using this in, in live lessons, but unfortunately with the recordings, we rely on them repeating to themselves. All we can do is lots of encouragement um, and tell them how important it is. On a video, I can't question whether the students have managed to link the icons, so I ask them to do a match task and then when they're ready um, to unpause the video and mark their, their score. This is just like I would do in class. I ask them to take a photo of um, their scores so that I can check how they get on. During live lessons, you can actually use the chat function quite effectively a bit like a mini whiteboard um, to get them to show you their score and then you can unmute them and talk to them about what they might have got wrong. So next slide, please. The next stage of the lesson is embedding the content and you can see I use a series of three different tasks that get progressively more challenging. The rationale behind the planning is exactly the same as in the classroom or a live lesson. I need to see if they have retained that initial input of language that was presented to them. Again, I can't question or use mini whiteboards, um, so the planning must guide students through the process, perhaps even more methodically than in a classroom. I must um, predict where misconceptions can happen and then talk the students through um, so, to, so as to avoid setting them up to fail. The dialogue must continue on this recording, even if I'm just talking to myself into a microphone. So once again, lots of pause, complete the work, mark the work, photograph, 
um, and that's just to keep students regulating their learning. The dialogue on the video would encourage them to res take responsibility for this. If they haven't got it, they can give it another go. The simple act of rewinding the video can potentially become quite a powerful tool in enabling students to properly address their understanding. Live lessons would follow the same structure, but at this point, rather than rewinding, they would obviously have the opportunity to ask me and I could re-explain perhaps using an alternative example. So next stage, uh, next um, slide please. The final stage um, of the lesson is to move towards production. So exactly as in the classroom, I would use a sentence builder or a grid to help model and scaffold higher level responses. In other cases, as Mary mentioned, we would use this at the beginning and work backwards. In this particular lesson, um, given the complexity, it comes a little bit later. We develop the grids with uh, coordinates to help facilitate quicker questioning so students don't need to write down the whole answers. But for more complex questions, we could pause the screen and ask them to take a bit of time to think about their answer. Again, just being able to pause is controlling their own think time. Um, and that's something that I think is quite a strength of the video lessons. As part of the production phase, I might ask them to send me a recording of themselves or a picture of a written paragraph. Celebrating and sharing success was absolutely at the heart of our remote teaching um, and it became a powerful motivational tool. So at our school, we would use feedback videos, we'd showcase some of the excellent work we'd received, we'd send home certificates. In live lessons, we could do this obviously live to students directly and talk the class through it in even more detail. But both worked really well at maintaining the student engagement. Finally, last slide, please. Um, extension work. So there is, um, as music already mentioned, an absolute wealth of online resources out there. And we really try to maximise the potential of online learning um, and embrace it, including links to other resources at the end of the lesson and just encouraging that extension work for those who were keen. So, sorry, final slide please, just to conclude. Um, things I've learned during this process. First of all, I must maintain and build rapport with students through the recorded dialogue. Um, I need to sound human, remembering that they need to feel the connection to the teacher. Live lessons was much easier, but I tried to take the same attitude into my recordings. I took a lot of feedback from students and wasn't scared to ask, had they enjoyed the lesson? What had they liked about it? What, what did they find worked? And then I would feed that back into my planning because we're all new to this. And one of the key things that um, student mentioned was just liking to know why, um, why it was relevant to the GCSE course. This helped them to feel reassured that they were, they were making the right progress. And finally, um, as has been previously mentioned, just to trust that if I plan a lesson well, the level of challenge can remain, the ambition can remain and the progress made by students can remain. So back to you, Steve. Thank you, Laura. A few reflections from me and what we've seen about across two subjects there. Firstly, is the focus on active participation, on getting pupils thinking, whichever subject it is they are studying. We know that memory is the residue of thought, a line from Daniel T. William, a cognitive scientist. And it's the idea that we, if we want pupils to remember stuff, we need to get them actively thinking about subject matter in the course of our teaching. What also struck me there was the extent to which the subject really shone through. So both in languages and and in music, they had settled upon a format which really brought out the best of their subject. And I think that settling upon a, a clear and consistent pattern is really important within each subject. And it's more important that there is that consistency within the subject than consistency across all subjects. I think it's OK that a music lesson online looks different to a languages lesson online. I think that's perfectly fine and reasonable and the subject should come first. So what we've seen is that effective online teaching requires clarity and simplicity. So as we plan our explanations, prepare our slides and set our tasks, 
we should make sure that we present information in the clearest possible terms, thinking again about the pupil who is watching on a phone, the pupils who the people who's working in a busy household, and the pupil who is trying to keep up with 10 lessons, uh, 10 different subjects across the curriculum. Online teaching is not the time to go off piste. It really is the time to focus on the core content. And the final thing I wanted to mention, I think there's a real benefit, as with classroom teaching, in, in thinking about planning across whole units rather than individual lessons. And I think it's really important that in the same way that in a single lesson, each slide or each bit of content would help to answer the, 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 the purpose of that lesson, would help to fulfill the purpose and so too across the whole unit, each lesson helps to answer the key question of that unit. That continuity uh, between lessons, I think, is really powerful when pupils are following the online curriculum. And a last point on that, although we're talking today about online teaching, let's not forget the power of paper resources to support this, whether it's booklets that pupils work on or knowledge organisers that might just present the key information, the key words for the pupils, enabling them to review prior learning and preview future Future learning that can be really powerful too. So thank you to our contributors today and thank you to those who have joined us as well and for the questions that you've posed and I think we've got a bit of time now just to pick up on a few of the questions. Yes hello Steve um, I'm, I've been reading three questions and we'll uh, pose them from, from here. So just to start with and I think to Laura and uh, Adam to start off with um, what was your experience of using the technology uh, and how quickly did you find you adapted to um, the kind of, yeah, the, effectively the kind of tools and te techniques that you were having to use? Uh, Laura, shall we start with you? Um, yeah, OK, well, I think it was uh, it was a learning curve for all of us. It was a journey and it was a journey that I think was really important that we had so much support from um, our staff here um, at Glenmore and Winton. So we used a lot of people's expertise and they would run briefings so that we'd all get a better idea on how to use it. Personally, um, I, I found PowerPoint quite user friendly. I found the recording, um, the video lessons on that quite straightforward. Um, as we got onto Teams and started the live teaching, certain things would come up. And again, it was all about discussion. It was all about asking for help. Um, but I personally found that it was relatively straightforward as long as you went and asked the questions when you needed to. Thank you. Adam, how about you? I agree with everything Laura said. I think the only thing that I would add is that the tricky part of the transition towards these software programmes was not so much from the teachers, but certainly from the students. And we were fortunate enough to spend a little bit of time with our pupils before we had the school closures to be able to ensure that they were they were fully up and running and they understood how these how these software programs worked um and I, I think you know certainly if if this was to happen again god forbid it doesn't but if it was we should certainly be trying to put some time aside now to upskill our young people into into using them far more than we should worry about the teaching staff doing so thank you and Adam, staying staying with you a moment, um, you talked um, about using Teams to sub, for, for pupils to submit work. Um, could you say a little bit about how that worked? Yeah, of course. Great question. So on Microsoft Teams, and I'll talk about Teams specifically because that's what we used, uh, inside each team on the top header panel that you can see all the, the members of the team, um, the sort of feed, and there's an assignment section. As you click on the assignment section, you can set um, any type of work, really. You can, you can attach a form to it or you can just describe the type of content that you want students to submit. As soon as you assign that assignment, students can then uh, upload um, pictures, videos, Word documents, uh, forms, anything really to that site and then press the hand in button and it goes directly to whoever's the administrator on that on that particular uh, group on that particular team uh, and I just I found it incredibly useful um, to be able to mark especially practical work recordings etc um, it, it, it really was absolutely essential thank you um 
sticking sticking with music for a minute um a, qu a question for you adam and or, and or for catherine about whether you found any ways of successfully um engaging students in ensemble playing online given the issues with uh syn synchronicity i mean uh i think the the thing to keep at the front of your mind is to think about what you can do, not about what you can't do. You know, some things are not going to be possible. Sadly, there is latency, there's delay. And even, you know, London Philharmonic Orchestra and the LSO are struggling with these sort of things when they're putting rehearsals together. That being said, there are some tricks you can use to help create an ensemble. Um, for example, if you have a backing track which students play along to, that's a really good tool, really good thing to use. And uh, as Adam used that um, sequencing uh, package in, in GarageBand in his lesson there, you can use things like that so that you can begin to create the ensemble and they can feel and, and see the movement of the different parts. But yeah, not everything is totally possible, but um, there's ways to mitigate it a little bit. Adam, have I missed anything? No, I don't think so. Um, yeah, exactly like you said, we made tons of use of backing tracks. And then as soon as we had all the sound files together, we could sort of slot them all together and present the students with what the ensemble would have sounded like if they were in the room together. But it's not perfect, but it does encourage them to play. And, you know, as we know from the, from the uh, when they were, when they were absent from school, like we have to keep the playing going and we have to keep the speaking going we have to keep the learning going so anything that we can do to show them that we appreciate their great work and to show them what that great work sounds like uh, is is just is worth doing thank you and steve starting with you on this one um we're now moving we're now in a world really where where the sort of um paradigm is very much kind of having some ch some children at home uh, self-isolating while uh, lessons continue in school and how far um, have you had to adapt the approach to think about that scenario as opposed to everyone being kind of in lockdown or Good question. I think at the start of this process, we thought that we just wouldn't be able to get the quality of delivery for, for kind of beaming or broadcasting a lesson to be viable. I think, as you've said, though, the situation has changed and what you've described is now very common uh, across many schools across the country. So now we are supporting our schools in this. I guess I see this as quite a, a technical question rather than a pedagogical one. It actually came up last week in the secondary leadership webinar um, where uh, one of my colleagues, Dominic Norris, who's a tech expert, um, talked people through the, the sort of mechanics of this process. Um, but it, it is something that is working uh, and we're seeing it being used across our schools. I might just bring in um, Laura and Adam in case I've got anything to add here, perhaps starting with Adam. Um, are, you, are you using this model? Um, we stuck with the asynchronous model the whole time, um, supplementing it in some some live teaching. But the you know the asynchronous synchronous model has helped us uh, deliver content uh, in a more secure manner. So. Thank you, Laura. Um, it's in the early stages. Our school is um, in the process of trialling and uh, looking at how we can try to get teachers who are at home who aren't ill um, actually still delivering lessons into classrooms and so we had a briefing on it on Monday and it's something that um, we're going to start trialling so hopefully there can still be that teacher voice in the classroom with a cover teacher obviously managing the behaviour and engagement of students but it's not something I've done yet but um, it's very much on the cards. Thanks Laura. Thank you. Um, and uh, I think probably, Laura, staying with you for a moment, um, how confident have you been through this process that the feedback you've been able to give students through asynchronous or synchronous teaching has had an impact when, when they've been learning remotely? Um, quite confident. Um, I think feedback is definitely one of our strengths. Um, in MFL. We really hone in on what the mistakes are um, that have been made, we look at why they've made them and then we can straight away put that into our quizzes in the next lesson, we can reteach content if necessary um, and I think that's worked quite well. There's been a lot of feeding um, in 
errors that we've found into future lessons. Um, in terms of marking individual work, that isn't something that we've sat and done. Um, it's been much more scanning for common errors and things like the quizzes give you a very quick view of what's been misunderstood and then we can reteach what's necessary. Um, but also lots on the celebration side of things and, and picking out work that we think is really effective or good and then showing it either on a visualizer in a live lesson or recording a special feedback video for students in which we show on the, on the um, PowerPoint excellent examples of work and why we think it's good work. I think it's the kids, have really, uh, the students have really engaged with that side of things, wanting to see their work on the screen, wanting their work to be celebrated. Um, so I think generally quite positive on the feedback. And and Adam, how have you, how has that worked for you? Well, we've been able to give quite useful feedback, I think, from a practical perspective, um, mainly because, well, each each instrument that you know we've had recorded, especially from a key stage four perspective, really does rely on 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 individual personalised feedback. Um, in terms of like, in terms of written work and that sort of thing, um, again, to echo Laura's, what Laura was saying, broadly scanning the work and then being able to allow that to filter into a feedback lesson, almost like a, a virtual crib sheet, um, was definitely successful in increasing the output um, from students. Um, so that that's the method we've, we've gone with. Obviously, like, whether that feedback takes hold entirely depends on uh, the enthusiasm of, of the students. Um, thankfully, the enthusiasm remained quite high, so the, the feedback was able to have an impact. Um, it remains to be seen whether that is the case where, when we get sort of kids uh, moving in and out on more of a fluid base rather than a sort of general lockdown. Thank you. And Steve, back to you for what I think maybe the final two questions. Um, just picking up again on where we are in the, the, the sort of current context, if uh, we have teachers who are self-isolating but are well and are able to continue working, um, what sort of um, approaches are we using to kind of enable them to continue to support learning from home when the children are in school? Good question and uh, I think Laura was touching on this as well so the, the kind of flip side of the pupils isolating and the um, standard classroom lesson being beamed to them the teacher is at home and we're trying to get their teaching across the pupils in the classroom the, the same answer really in terms of using teams and using visualizers obviously with a, a fully supervised um, lesson and a member of staff there a cover teacher or another teacher there um, making sure that and supporting pupils in the classroom to do the work so you know we think that through using teams through using visualizers that we we can maintain that contact effectively between the teacher at home and the pupils in the class. Thank you. And I think final question, how are, how are we advising schools to think about um, monitoring both attendance and I guess engagement of students who are self-isolating at home but still accessing learning uh, either because bubbles have been sent home or because individual students are, are being sent home. It's obviously a challenge we tackled. We, we had, you know, fairly consistently during lockdown, but what, what were the things that we kind of learned about what worked then? I think all the thing that works, all the stuff that works well in schools works really well uh, in this format too. And that, you know, schools are, are excellent at um, maintaining contact with hard to reach pupils, maintaining relationships with parents, communicating home really clearly and effectively. And I think what we found is that during lockdown and beyond, uh, the school community worked so hard together, uh, the pastoral team with the teaching team um, to support all families and all learners throughout this process. Um, and I think that, you know, swift and clear communication, picking up on things really quickly, you know, tracking completion of work through some of the things that Adam mentioned, you know, through using the assignment system through Teams, for example, and quickly following that up um, enables some of those issues, some of engagement and tracking to be you know, quickly picked up. And I think you know, we focus today on, on teaching and curriculum. And what I would say is that if, if, we, can, um, if we can prepare some of our lessons in advance and we focused on pre-recorded asynchronous teaching,
teaching, then that can free up uh, the resource in the school you know, to, to be responsive, to focus on those pupils that maybe are not engaging, focus on pupils that maybe uh, there are some barriers to their learning. So I think that by um, preparing our teaching resources in advance, we can then use the sort of time, energy and capacity we have in the school to respond to the needs of, um, of, of pupils and families as they emerge. Thank you. And on a very practical level, we've had a question about kind of how, how do you kind of just keep track of attendance when pupils are self isolating at home without sort of overriding the the attendant, the sort of what's in the school register, which obviously will be uh, COVID related absence, but we want them to still be attending or still engaging. Maybe Adam could pick up that one from a school perspective. Thanks, Steve. Um, I don't. I don't really know the answer from a from a, a sort of. I don't know an, an official perspective in terms of what like should go on the registers, um, etc. But uh, to give you an anecdotal um, idea of what we did, uh, or what we do at Goresbrook is that for anybody who is uh, not in the building, um, we have a uh, an online tracking register that accounts for every period of that day uh, every lesson that they would have and at the end of that lesson they need to submit work once the work has been submitted and um, depending on the quality they either get you know if it's great quality they get a green if it's they haven't submitted it at all it's a red if it's a varying quality it gets an amber and then over the course of the day we're able to see what lessons they're attending what lessons they're not what type of content they're producing for those lessons so um, one, we can hold them to account and two, we can see patterns over the course of the day. Where do they drop in? Where do they drop out? And then how do we appropriately um, target those pupils using our pastoral staff uh, to, 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 to try and, uh, you know, increase the volume or increase the quality? Uh, and that's and that's that's what we've done here. So yeah, and it seemed to work quite well so far. Thank you very much uh, and uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so over to you, Steve, really just to close off. Thank you, Anna. And yeah, thank you to our contributors today. And thank you for those who have joined us and the questions that you've answered. I hope that we've um, been able to respond to your questions and uh, thank you once again for joining us. Goodbye. <laughs>